from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is U.S. Farm Report. Welcome to U.S. Farm Report this weekend as we continue our 2019 AgriTalk U.S. Farm Report College Roadshow from my alma mater, University of Missouri, Columbia. And as the university gears up for homecoming this weekend, we have a lot in store over the next 60 minutes. The growing season came to a frigid halt for some crops this week. The cold wind and snow now putting another difficult layer on a tough year. The White House's biofuels policy was unveiled. Is it a win for ethanol, oil, or both? Growing Missouri's economy through food and a tasty Mizzou tradition for generations. The story behind the popular Tiger Stripe ice cream. The 2019 U.S. Farm Report College Roadshow from the University of Missouri is brought to you by the Champions of Yield. DeKalb Asgro. Score the next W for your operation. Visit your DeKalb Asgro dealer today. Well, we're excited to be at the University of Missouri this week as the university is preparing for homecoming. And some say this is where homecoming got its start. But it's not just a rich history at Mizzou that is being highlighted this week. It's also a look to the future and how food and forestry can play a role in fueling Missouri's economy. We'll talk about that later in the show. But first for the news, Mother Nature making a quick switch this week, and it was the weather and the latest crop production report that was really the focus of the markets. A major snowstorm hitting the northern plains and Rockies, followed by cold air that meant an abrupt halt to the growing season this year. The areas of concern, Montana, Wyoming, western Nebraska, and the Dakotas. The National Weather Service in Grand Forks, North Dakota, calling for a crippling blizzard this weekend. This picture taken just outside of Bismarck, the roads wet and snow covered. Near Denver, Colorado, the first snow of the season turning to ice, creating flash freeze conditions. It will likely cause sub-freezing temperatures and an end to the growing season across roughly the northwestern half of the Corn Belt starting this weekend. That will effectively end any further potential for corn and soybeans to develop. Well, it'll take a while to see what damage and what impact this cold weather had on the national yield, but USDA did give an update to crops this week. Planting meant a late start to the crop. Only 15% of the corn crop has been harvested according to the latest crop progress report from USDA. The five-year average is 27%. And particularly telling, only 58% of the crop is considered mature by USDA. Usually it's 85% right now. That's record-setting late development. Soybeans not really faring much better. Only 14% harvested. Usually it's 34% and 72% of the crop is dropping leaves compared to the five-year average, which is 87%. That's also a record. USDA further revising yield expectations this week, pegging corn yields actually up slightly from the September report. But overall production is down along with planted and harvested acres. Corn used for ethanol is also down. Now as for soybeans, yields dropping here a full bushel. Planted acres and harvested acres also down. Production is down 2% from last month. If realized, it would mark the lowest soybean production since 2013. And a quick look at the wheat crop. Yields are the same as last month with drops in planted and harvested acres, ending stocks though increasing by 29 million and new crop soybeans now forecast to be 460 million bushels still a lot but that's down 180 million bushels from September corn ending stocks lowered by 261 million bushels and on the trade front the U.S. and China holding their 13th round of trade negotiations this week and we're following breaking news, reports of a partial agreement between the U.S. and China towards ending the trade war. The commodity and stock markets soaring on the news. Bloomberg reporting Friday afternoon that as part of the trade deal, China would agree to buy more U.S. agriculture product in exchange for some tariff relief. President Trump meeting Friday at the White House with China's top trade envoy. Before that, Mr. Trump tweeted out saying, quote, good things are happening at China trade talk meeting. Warmer feelings than in recent past, more like the old days, quote, uh, going on to say all would like to see something significant happen. Now going into the meeting, expectations were low. The negotiations would do much to resolve the 15 month trade war. We'll continue to keep you posted on this developing story on agweb.com. Well, it's official. The U.S. and Japan signing a mini trade deal this week. In the United States, these deals are a game changer for our farmers and our ranchers, providing them with significantly enhanced access to a critical foreign market. Well, from trade to another hot-button topic in agriculture, 
biofuels and new details are being rolled out about the Trump administration's new biofuels plan that would ensure 15 billion gallons of ethanol are used each year. EPA Director Andrew Wheeler saying the action announced last Friday strikes a balance so the agency can continue to offer the small refinery exemptions. He says the EPA will come out with the supplemental plan for next year's biofuel and the 2021 biodiesel levels in a week or so, followed by a 30 day comment period. The rule is on track to be finalized later this year. That's it for the news. Well, we let off with it in the show that weather, all the snow, the cold and the possible lethal winds to crops this week. But we'll get an in-depth check of weather. That's next. U.S. Farm Report is presented by the Chevy Silverado and the all-new Silverado HD, the strongest, most advanced family of Silverados ever. Time now for a check of weather with meteorologist Mike Kaufman. Mike, I hate to admit you're right, but you were right. You warned us last week about this abrupt change to the temperatures and the forecast. What felt like summer now feels and looks like winter to some. Well, thanks, Tyne. That was abrupt, and in fact, it was even more impressive than I thought it might be. One of the more impressive ones I saw was a drop from 82 to 32, a 50-degree drop in seven hours in Denver, Colorado. And you factor in the wind chill, it's another 10, so it felt like it was 60 degrees colder. Well, let's check the root zone moisture. This is uh, from earlier this past week. You can see still very wet conditions, the upper Midwest. Great Lakes, Northern Plains. Of course, this area ended up with a whole bunch of snow out of that system, which is melting. Uh, add to that moisture. Uh, the flash drought basically in the southeast, or at least I know parts of the southeast, you've been getting dry uh, off and on throughout the uh, summer, but all of a sudden we're seeing a much larger area. Now, it has improved somewhat uh, in parts of Kentucky and western Tennessee, but boy, from the mid-Atlantic into the southeast. And then there's also dry areas, Colorado, back into Utah and uh, parts of Texas. The longer range then, the drought monitor shows it even worse in Texas. That's a long-term drought. Uh, many areas seeing a severe to extreme drought, central and southern Texas. And we're seeing those pockets uh, from the eastern Tennessee and Ohio valleys into uh, other parts of the southeast, all the way into northern portions of Florida. Let's check the pattern this week. It's different than we were seeing. This is the remnants of that storm system. It's been sitting here kind of weakening, obviously, as they do, but that's uh, just going to barely fold into the jet stream and move into eastern Canada by Wednesday. Another piece of energy diving through the northern tier of states as we head through the end of next week. Another piece of energy right there, another trough moving across the northern uh, plain states into the western Great Lakes by Friday. That moves on east, and then it looks like a decent trough once again developing in the western plains by next weekend with the ridge kind of popping up into the mid-Atlantic. Now that's not good news and in and, and actuality for the southeast anyway. When you have troughs moving through the northern tier states, you don't get a lot of moisture out of those either. So let's check things out day by day. None of these systems on Monday are anything to write home about. This is the remnants of the big storm. This just has a little bit of snow and uh, rain on the southern end of it. Spotty showers and storms through the southeast and Gulf Coast. Spotty showers and storms southwest and a few flakes and <laughs> moist, uh, drops of moisture up in the far northern portions of the Rockies. Wednesday it starts to get a little more active. Rain and snow in the eastern Great Lakes. Scattered thunderstorms across the Gulf Coast. Rain and snow in the northwest. And then the same idea as each little system moves from west to east through the northern Ontario states. Interesting, some models showing a tropical-like system near the end of next week in the western Gulf. 30-day outlook for temperatures above normal east coast, Gulf Coast into the southwest, below normal from western Wisconsin all the way into Oregon and Washington. Precipitation over the next uh, 30 days above normal from the northeast into the central plains, west Texas, also the northwest below normal in California and Nevada. Tyne. Thanks, Mike. Well, next up, we'll sit down with some of the leading economists, not only on China, but biofuels policy from right here at the University of Missouri. Pat Westoff, Seth Meyer, and Scott Brown join me next. Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report this weekend. Well, it turned just a, a tad chilly from what we had been experiencing here, but we're still excited for our 2019 AgriTalk U.S. Farm Report College Roadshow. We have Scott Brown, Pat Westoff, as well as Seth Meyer with us this week, three economists here at the University of Missouri. Seth, we'll start off with you Thursday. Got an updated look at production from USDA. Not a lot of people expected USDA to actually raise the corn yield, but that's exactly what we saw. 
Yeah, I think that was a, the, the surprise, uh, you know, added a couple tenths of a bushel. I think folks were looking more to have a bit of a decrease, including me. I thought we might see a little bit less, and the market took it kind of hard, maybe a little too hard yesterday. And now there's some arguments that we're seeing this big winter storm, seeing a hard a freeze in some areas that could impact production. I mean, do you think it's going to have that big of an impact on production this time of the year? I, I think you could still have an impact, uh, but I also got to, you know, I see a lot of folks talking about saying, okay, uh, here's an Im they calculate an impact by saying perfect conditions versus a freeze. You know, that's not the way NAS does it exactly. So I definitely think there could be an impact, um, but we'll have to wait and see what we get tonight. Nonetheless, on the corn demand side of things, Pat, nothing to write home about. Hasn't been great. What needs to happen to really boost demand so we could start eating away at the, the, these supplies? Well, it'd be nice if uh, folks elsewhere in the world had bad weather, right? You know, so South American crop has been bigger than anticipated. A lot of uh, South American corn and soybeans heading to market. How that crop develops in South America will be a lot to do with our future. Uh, the demand side, of course, we're all worried about what's going to happen on, on the overall global economy and what that might mean for food demand as well. We're still arguing acreage right now. I'm seeing some producers still arguing, arguing acreage as well as USDA has to come down on this corn yield some more. But we're already in October. Realistically, Seth, when you see some of these calculations, you have experience with WASD at USDA. But at this time of the year, how likely is it that we will see a large reduction in this national corn yield? Uh, I mean, it's possible, but it's unlikely at this point. Normally, uh, when you look at historically, those yields tend to really narrow down by the October estimate. And yeah, we can talk about the crops behind and a little bit less mature, but there still isn't a strong relationship over time. I mean, you shouldn't expect large yield and area changes at this point going forward. We did see a little bit more of an adjustment in the soybean yield, Scott, and it seems like that's an area now that we're seeing those carry out while it's still big, seeing USDA reduce that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. When you look at where we're at in terms of carry out, you know, just think about where we were six or eight months ago, and, and we're in a much better place with less than 500 million bushels, according to USDA. And I think you could put weather on top of that and say maybe soybeans a little more at risk as we get through the rest of this year in terms of the yield side could shorten that crop up even more. We're seeing those, those supplies deplete a little bit. At the same time, had a meeting with China this week. We saw a trade delegation meet, meeting, hearing that China could buy this 10 million metric ton of soybeans, the number that's been thrown around, I feel like, for almost a year. Let's say we do actually see China step up at the plate and buy a significant amount of soybeans. How much would you want to see them buy to have a significant impact on this market right now? Well, now that we have lower levels of carry-on, it doesn't take quite as many Chinese purchases to make a difference. Uh, you know, USDA's projected export figure for this year is not much different than it was last year. So if we got a positive surprise there, it could actually tighten up those stocks pretty quickly and give you a good bump on prices. Seth, I mean, it seems like maybe we have a, a bullish or a more friendly story brewing for soybeans right now. Well, I mean, I, I think things have to happen, right? I mean, you, you, will we get a China deal? I mean, uh, th there's the opposite side of that as well, too, which is, you know, 90 million acres of beans next year and the normal yield. You know, so I think that there's a lot riding on the line in terms of what exports look like and what a deal with China might look like in this case. Right. Scott, what's your biggest concern right now when you look at the supplies, not as small as what we thought maybe this summer, that this wet spring maybe didn't have as much of an impact on our national yield and production as we thought? So I think it comes down to what are the opportunities for producers to lock in some higher prices as we go forward. It has a lot to do with what happens to this crop when we ultimately get it in the bin. But more importantly, where's, those, where's acreage for corn and soybeans go next year? We could be in a very difficult situation next year to find pricing opportunities with big crops being put in the ground and normal yields. Well, and Pat, we've, we've talked about 100 million acres of corn next year, but it seems like corn prices may be going the opposite direction of soybeans. Do you think it changes that acreage debate already for next year? Yeah, I mean, if you look at the relative price of soybeans and corn right now, it's actually saying soybeans are an okay choice yeah. for 2020. And so you can imagine a world where we plant something like the level of, of acreage for both corn and beans next year that people thought they were going to plant this year before we had all the weather problems. That give you more supplies of both crops. All right, we're going to take a quick break, try to warm up, and we'll be back with much more right here on the list. Well, some comments made last week by Agriculture Secretary Sonny Perdue at the World Dairy Expo created a firestorm on social media, but some of those comments weren't construed correctly, but it did spark a John's World this week. He joins us now from the farm. Secretary of Agriculture Sonny Perdue ruffled some farmer feathers the last week with a remark about the future of small dairies. 
Now, there's been an awful lot of coverage in the media with varying degrees of accuracy since about what he said, but I think the best summary uh, you can find is by Chip Flory, and it's on AgWeb. The whole flap centers on the economic viability of very small dairies, and frankly, that handwriting has been on the wall for decades. Due to the nature of that type of operation with high and continuous labor requirements, widely available but expensive automation, and an unhelpful regulated market, we've been watching one-family dairies go out of business for my entire career. Dairy just scales up too well, and even dairy farmers won't accept any type of change to the bizarre dairy pricing scheme that protects only those small operations, assuming such a policy is even possible, which I doubt. But it is the inference that small farms of all kinds are doomed as well that needs to get stopped by clear evidence right now. For grain farms like mine, small operations of a few hundred acres are not merely viable, but probably among some of the lowest cost producers and strongest financially of all commodity grain in the U.S. Virtually all small farms involve at least one family member working full-time off-farm, or even better, receiving retirement checks from past employment. I look at operations around me like that with envy using equipment likely handed down from parents who farmed, owning a significant chunk of their relatively small acres, and with secure health insurance, dismissing them as part-timers is a mistake. Operations like, like them may be the tail end of a farm, family farm, but if you remember my analysis of how land is constantly accumulating and then dispersing as families grow, we are always making more part-timers or post-timers, as I call second career operators. No big farmers going to rent ground away from brothers and nephews, and, and the acres inherited allow these smaller farms to capture more of the growing landowner's share of income. If you want to sound a warning, it should be for the now perilous mid-sized farmers. Unless you were born or married to the land, the economics of supporting a family on rented acres is becoming impossible in the 500 to 1500 acre range, even with one spouse working. Like small dairy farms, this, this is the group in grain farming that faces a stark future. Oddly enough, one solution is to get a job and scale down to join the ranks of the unwisely disrespected small farms. Well, as John mentioned, AgriTalk host Chip Flory did press Agriculture Secretary Sonny Perdue on those comments, clearing the air on some things. It's definitely worth a listen. It's posted on agweb.com, but we've also posted it on the U.S. Farm Report Facebook page. All right, when we come back, Tractor Tales, well, we're sticking to right here in the Show Me State. Machine and Repeat has Tractor Tales. That's next. Welcome back to Tractor Tales, folks. This week we're going back in time to learn about a family-owned 1937 Alice Chalmers WC. My grandpa bought it brand new in 1937. He farmed with it about, oh, I think maybe around four years or so, and then uh, he started having some health issues. The doctor told him he needed to get rid of the tractor and slow down. So he sold the tractor and went back to using horse and team. It was out of the family all these years and about early, early 1980s, my dad had retired and he decided he'd like to try to find that tractor. Well, he could remember the man's name that had bought it and thought he knew generally where he lived so him and his buddy went out looking for it and they found him. When they pulled up to the farm, they could see the tractor sitting in the fence row. It took him about two years to get it, get it bought. He didn't want to sell it at first. So he bought it and put it in his barn and it sat there for several years. Then about, oh, 2003 or so, I got a hold of it and I decided I wanted to get it, get it rebuilt for my grandpa Benton's sake, you know, and I got her all done and, and I take it to several shows of all the tractors I own, this is the only one that for sure will, will never be sold if I have anything to do with it. I plan on handing it down to uh, grandsons and then it'll be their responsibility to do whatever they want to with it. But I've got a little two bottom uh, 212 plow that I'll take out and, and plow with it every once in a while. And, and it's, it's pretty neat that old, you put, 
put a load on that tractor and it'll just cackle. It, it's really neat. I'd rather plow off that thing than, than anything else out there. Thanks so much. Well, a new initiative here in Missouri is focused on the future, banking on agriculture to fuel the economy. That's our Farm Journal report next. Closed captioning is brought to you by BASF. Grow smart with BASF. We create chemistry. U.S. Farm Report is produced and distributed by Farm Journal Broadcast. Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report. Trusted, timely, tradition. The 2019 U.S. Farm Report College Roadshow from the University of Missouri is brought to you by the Champions of Yield. DeKalb Asgro, score the next W for your operation. Visit your DeKalb Asgro dealer today. Welcome back to the University of Missouri for a College Roadshow this week. Well, agriculture has a rich history here in Missouri and it's diversity that helps agriculture thrive. Missouri is home to nearly 100,000 farms that ranks second in the country. But now agriculture is focusing on the future with a new initiative that would link food to college universities, helping fuel the future. And leaders say it's a future that hinges on some major touchdowns for agriculture. From row crops to cattle to tree nuts like walnuts and pecans, Agriculture is the Show Me State's top economic driver. So we're really excited about the food and beverage initiative because we think it's going to add a lot of value to the great products that our Missourian farmers and ranchers are already producing here in the state. It's champions like Missouri Director of Agriculture Chris Chen passionate about keeping agriculture alive. Passion that also resides with Lieutenant Governor Mike Kehoe, a first generation rancher. For one, we want to find out if there's barriers the government is creating to getting in the way of these family farms to be able to grow and continue to produce. We want to find out what those are and find out if there's practical way to solve those issues. It's that desire to help agriculture grow that fueled the state's new food and beverage initiative, signing off with an executive order in June. I think it's imperative for us as policymakers, as well as educators and other people as part of the task force to make sure we understand how Missouri and their family farms can be prepared to enter this large food demand that we're going to see over the next 25 years. The next 25 years is also a focus for Dr. Dean Dalbert, the Dean of the College of Agriculture, Food and Natural Resources at the University of Missouri. We want students to have a pathway to stay here in Missouri. A pathway Dalbert thinks starts with building off of core commodities that have been the foundation of Missouri's agriculture industry for generations. We have a depth of commodities here in Missouri and we have opportunities to expand the utilization of those commodities and the things that we use each and every day. Missouri's Director of Agriculture Chris Chen teamed up with Daubert to champion the new push. And we did it because we realized that right now in agriculture we need a bright spot. You know, with, with the weather and the flooding that we've had, with the trade uncertainty, low commodity prices, it was so important that we find something to reinvigorate agriculture to help entice that new generation to come back home. Chen says that starts with revealing new market opportunities. One of the things that I've heard a lot of are farmers who want to do direct marketing to consumers, but they don't know how to do it. They don't know how to get that business plan started. They don't know where to go. They don't know what that demand is. An opportunity Daubert also wants to capitalize on. I oftentimes give the example that my grandmother, she made the greatest strawberry preserves. And I used to tell her, Nana, you need to get that strawberry jelly on the grocery store shelf, but she wouldn't have known how to do that. So this initiative, if somebody has that interest, would be able to say, look, we can help you process that product safely. We can help you label it properly. And if there are regulatory issues that you need to address or a business plan, this initiative would help you get that product into your local retailer on the grocery store shelf. Chin says the initiative isn't just tapping into the resources at Mizzou, 
but all the universities residing in Missouri. We're hoping as we continue to talk about it, we're going to get entrepreneurs with new ideas who come to us and say, hey, have you thought about this? Um, and the neat thing about this is that we're open to all ideas. We just want to make sure that we are adding value to the farms here in Missouri. Focusing on the future by helping open new doors for the next generation. It's going to give um, the next generation of agriculturalists new ways of thinking. You know, it, there's nothing wrong with the way we're farming right now, but we want them to know that it's okay to think outside of the box and have new creative ideas and try something. From building off a strong foundation to cooking up new ideas and creations, a University of Missouri feasibility study found this new initiative could add $25 billion to the $88 billion already driving Missouri's economy each year. There are so many opportunities in agriculture right now, it's just incredible and uh, young folks need to take a look at this and know that this is a great demand and Missouri is a great place to be able to pr prove our production capabilities. Building off the past while focusing on the future is what these leaders hope will drive agriculture, mapping out a future where agriculture won't just survive but thrive in the show me state. Well speaking of the future, a lot of it hinges on key exporting partners, and that's something University of Missouri's FAPRI has been exploring extensively. We'll sit down with our three economists next. Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report. Well, we are loving, well, I'm loving these signs here. Dr. Brown, you're a little upset that nothing says this club loves Scott Brown. I don't know where my signs are this morning, Ty, and well, I don't know why you get all the signs. Listen, I envision in every class you have them holding up those fat heads of your of your head, rooting for you every single class. I, I gave them out the last oh, class as well. I knew, I knew, and they just didn't show up. Yes. All right. Well, let's move, uh, uh, switch gears a little bit. Biofuels. We saw the White House unveil a biofuels plan. Uh, you know, it, it seems like ethanol groups were, were excited about it. Didn't hear much from the oil groups, but now I'm hearing some criticism from some in the industry thinking that this could actually open the door for more small refinery waivers. Well, I, th I think when you look at the deal, I, first of all, a little short on detail. They, they floated it out there. A little um, or a lot short? A lot short on okay. details. All right. And, and, I, and I think that it also opens the door to both continuing to give waivers and trying to take an action to offset them. But without a lot of details, it's, it's, it's really tough to tell whether this means a tighter mandate or not. And we need more demand. But does this new plan support corn demand? I think... Any way you look at it, the, if, you, you shouldn't expect a big jump in corn grind in the near term. I think depending on how the plan looks, you could get a little bit of underlying support for some additional use longer run, you know, out a few more years. Uh, but you shouldn't expect a big jump in corn grind no matter what the deal looks like in the very short run. You know, we're, we're talking about demand. We're seeing actually South America export some corn to the U.S., something that I've, I've heard some rumblings about. Does that happen every year, or is this something new this year, Pat? It doesn't happen every single year, but it does happen quite frequently. You know, some logistic issues why the East Coast can, can profitably import corn from South America. Then why do you think it's hitting headlines this year? Why is it such a big deal this year if it's happened before? I think there's a lot of sensitivity this year about the, where the situation is and people wanting prices to be higher than they are right now and being very unhappy that we're seeing these imports occur. All right, Scott, let's switch over to livestock. Uh, we're talking about the impacts of, of, of uh, you know, the, this Tyson plant fire in Kansas and what drove the markets. I mean, we had a really big knee-jerk reaction. We talked about it last weekend on the show. Do you think it was just fundamentals? It was economics or are there other factors that drove that market, Scott? Well, I certainly think any time you take five or six percent of our daily slaughter capacity out on the cattle side, you're going to have a lot of uncertainty. And I, I think markets reacted to that uncertainty in the very short term with what ended up being higher box beef prices, lower fed cattle prices. But now that we've seen this unfold for a few weeks, markets getting used to that situation. We've seen fed cattle prices that have come up, albeit not back to where we were, and box beef prices coming down. Do you think prices can continue to trend higher as we head into the, the later part of the year? I think we have some opportunity for a little bit of price strength. We don't want to overestimate what's left in this market, just given what I'll say is overall meat supplies. We can talk about more cattle coming, but the overall meat supply standpoint in this country, it's been growing and continues to grow this year. I worry about what that does in terms of keeping a lid on price strength generally in the livestock complex. What about dairy? I mean, we've seen better prices. Can that continue? Yeah, so if you look, you know, we've lost about 120,000 dairy cows since the start of 2018. Wow. 
two-thirds of those in the first half of that downtrend. Now we're kind of seeing as we're slowing that uh, loss of, of dairy cows. I worry that's what it takes, more declines in the supply side to get prices to continue to move higher. The outlier or the one that could change that a lot, of course, is China. Well, you led into my next question for VAT perfectly. Pat, what if we don't see an agreement come out of trade talks? And we're, we're recording this on Friday, so we don't know what's going to happen out of these talks. What if we don't see something the rest of this year? Right. So we've seen China, you know, purchase some soybeans, purchase some other products recently, probably as goodwill gestures as part of the negotiations that are trying to happen. If they were to decide that we're not getting where we want to get and decide not to do that going forward, that would obviously be a very big market negative. And we're very excited about the soybeans and other products we sold the last few weeks, but still a very small share of what we would have sold in the past. And uh, we don't seem to be on track to get that back unless there's a broader agreement. Seth, you've been shaking your head. You agree with that? Well, and, and, and their sales, they're on the books. They, you know, what you want to see is you want to see those soybeans turn from being on the books to actually being inspected and on a ship. That's what you want to see because they could be canceled. If things don't go right, they could be canceled. You want to see that conversion. Well, I'm hoping for a, a Chinese trade deal and a Mizzou win this weekend. So we'll see if we come out with both and then we're, 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 we're setting nice, right? Thank you all for joining us this weekend. Always a pleasure having you on, Seth. Thank you, Pat, Scott. We really appreciate it. All right, we need to take a quick break, and then we'll have much more from right here at the University of Missouri when we come back from U.S. Farm Report. Well, there are several iconic logos and structures here at the University of Missouri. One of those, this logo right behind me. And while there may have been some variations over the years, there's one iconic ice cream that hasn't changed. And while the flavor is great, the story behind it is even better. From the late 1800s. So you could take a course on how to make butter. Oh yeah. In those days, there was a lot of training needed. Dairy has been a foundation of the University of Missouri, but it wasn't until the 1980s one of Mizzou's most iconic ice creams came to life. I created a black and gold ice cream. So my name got around because people like it. Robert Marshall is one of the creators of not just any ice cream, but the beloved Tiger Stripe ice cream. It's the black and gold colors of the tigers. The iconic tasty treat didn't just happen by chance, but by science. The way it gets to be black and gold is to have some uh, gold color primarily put in there by the 1.4% egg yolk solids that we put in it. Now that's uncommon for most ice creams. It's not just the egg yolk that made the flavor so rare. If you're going to have a gold ice cream and you're going to make it black, you've got to have a thick running syrup that when it gets cold will stay there. It's that thick ribbon or the stripe that was the most difficult attribute to achieve. Finding the cocoa that would make the black chocolate and then the mixture that would keep it, let it run into the ice cream, and then as soon as it hits the freezer, gel up and stay where we put it. Today, the face behind the treasured treat is proud of what it created both inside and outside the home of Mizzou's food science. I think I'm, I'm most proud of how with the manufacturing by our various students, it stays the same. And 50 years later, the university is unveiling another esteemed ice cream flavor. Our students, our food science students, uh, took a challenge from our chancellor, Alex Cartwright, to come up with a flavor of ice cream that sort of captured the heart of Missouri. A challenge that kicked off at the start of the year. They've been at it for the last few months. The challenge was accepted by students like Allie Martin. The chancellor and the dean came to us and said that they wanted to put pawpaw, which is now the state fruit, into ice cream. She says the pawpaw is a fruit that boasts powerful flavors. A pawpaw fruit is basically mango and banana combined. Sweetening up a fruit that by itself can actually taste bitter. We had to make sure that when we added the pawpaw that the ice cream wouldn't get 
super bitter and wouldn't be unappealing to customers. Discovering the science behind the flavors turned into an ice cream with a unique taste. We blended some vanilla ice cream in there and then the candied black walnut is uh, just gives it a little bit of a, a crunch and a little bit of pizzazz to it. A class project that could live on for generations. I think it's cool to say that we've used Missouri State Fruit now and the walnut um, and we're able to create something that no one has really done before. From new flavors, we just put this Tiger Papa out to the exquisite flavors that are the bedrock of Bucks. So your reward today is rest my cream. The traditions are thriving. They always will smile when you feed them some fine black and gold tiger stripe. With current students scooping up a slice of history that keeps ice cream lovers clamoring for more. I had no idea there was so much science behind that flavor, but let me tell you, the taste is heavenly. Well, people here in Missouri, some are still living with flooding every day, but it's crop contamination and other factors caused by flooding that could have a very long tail. John Phipps has customer support next. What to do with contaminated soybeans? Hey y'all, Justin Moore here. Get ready to kick up some dust with the Rock Sword Dirt Roads and a Country Show Sweepstakes. Enter now for a chance to win a customized off-road Rock Sword and two VIP tickets to one of my upcoming concerts. Visit rocksoaroffroad.com forward slash Justin Moore. Please hold. Welcome back. Well, flooding is far from over here in Missouri, but it's impacting a lot of other states and it's a flooding and more than just along the Missouri River that could have a long tail on crop production. Here's John Phipps. Well, we got a different kind of question from Kurt Barkle in Presque Isle, Michigan. There were 91,000 bushels of soybeans held in quarantine in Hamilton, Michigan since 2016. The ruling had come down that these were to be destroyed. There had been a Superfund cleanup along the Kalamazoo River and soil from that activity had been spread in an area that was then used for farming, which was a prohibited activity. It had been determined that 145 bushels actually came from the contaminated land and had been combined into the 91,000 bushels with no way to identify or separate them out. What is the impact of the aggregate lost land not available to farm. Is this land identified and tallied somewhere? What might be the process of destroying soybeans and then disposing of the remains somewhere, so somehow, so as to not create a new contaminated area? Maybe they could be respread over the original contaminated land. Sounds a little like whack-a-mole. Kirk, I looked into this, and like all super fun cleanups, it is proceeding with the, what shall we say, deliberate speed. Although it seems like they take forever, such work cannot be rushed, especially with limited budgets and a long list of sites to be corrected. This cleanup site is due to PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyl compounds, from paper mills along the Kalamazoo River, which oddly enough, it came from a waste product from carbonless copy paper. The soybeans were grown on farming prohibited bottom land and sold, either knowingly or not, to CHS, where they were commingled with the other 91,000 bushels. As you can guess, lawsuits are underway to assess blame and reparations. While that is a pile of beans, it really doesn't make a dent in our national supply, and after three years in storage, I wouldn't want to own them. Keep in mind, too, there are 650,000 bushels of rotten beans still burning in Missouri after the floods. Now, if the PCB contamination exceeds 50 parts per million, the material must be deposited in a secure landfill. I doubt the soybeans will be anywhere close to that limit, so can, they can be disposed of in a regular landfill. Spreading them back on the land, as you say, simply makes another cleanup action possible, at least a lawsuit. Given this is bottom land and the way the increased rainfall has occurred in the northern Corn Belt, I don't think we'll miss those acres or the soybeans at all. Thanks, John. Well, I'll tell you who will miss those acres, and that's the farmers that have been farming that ground for generations. All right, when we come back, there's lots of tradition here at the University of Missouri, one of those homecoming, but it's alum that keeps those traditions alive. 
That's from the farm next. Welcome back from the farm this week, closing out from the University of Missouri, where it turned cold all of a sudden with John Rains, who's with the Climate Corporation, as well as Truman the Tiger behind us, both of us proud Mizzou alums. And you know, this weekend, John is homecoming, a very prideful time for not only current students, but alum, and an exciting homecoming in store every year here. We play the Ole Miss Rebels this weekend. The uh, homecoming and homecoming in general started here on the University of Missouri campus back several decades ago. It's really a proud moment. Yeah, it's a big deal, and I know you don't miss homecoming. The whole family comes I back I don't. For My it. wife, Buffy, and the kids are on their way here That's as so we fun. speak. So fun. Yeah. Well, John's also passionate about the future of farming as well as you know, making sure all farmers have access to rural broadband, something that's been, been challenging in some areas, John. It's, it's been extremely challenging. In fact, I was just at the Farm Progress Show a few weeks ago. I had the chance to sit down with Jeffrey Sparks. Jeffrey is the commissioner of the uh, Federal Communications Commission. We had a great conversation. They're spending $4.9 billion wow. with over 170 companies to help drive rural broadband connectivity. What does that do for agriculture? It helps connect data science to the farm. John, one of the, the many alums from the College of Agriculture, Food and Natural Resources, who is excelling in his field. John, so good to see you. It's Thank great to see so you. Yes, Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. All right, for Truman the Tiger, John Raines, Tyne Morgan, and all of us at U.S. Farm Report, thank you so much for joining us this weekend for our 2019 College Roadshow. Join us next weekend as we take our show on the road to NASCAR. Closed captioning is brought to you by BASF. Grow smart with BASF. We create chemistry. U.S. Farm Report is produced and distributed by Farm Journal Broadcast.